question number four on graphing rational functions. There is a procedure that you have to go through, but the first thing you need to do is factor the numerator and factor the denominator. The numerator has a GCF of x, so when you take out an x from all three terms, you are left with x squared plus 5x minus 6. And when you look at the denominator, that is dots. So I'll start off with x plus 6, x minus 6. But the numerator has a trinomial in it that you can continue to factor. The numbers that multiply to 6 and subtract to 5 are 6 and 1. So just make sure your signs are in correctly. It is x times x plus 6 times x minus 1. And it's all divided by x plus 6 times x minus 6. The moment you look at your factored version and you can cancel out something from the top and the bottom, that's when you know that there's a hole in the graph. My reduced version is x times x minus 1 over x minus 6. And I'm just going to box it off. But there is definitely a hole in the graph. So in the section that asks you, where is there a hole in the graph? I'm gonna write down f of x has a hole in the graph. At, and I'm gonna give the coordinates of the hole. And once again, to get the x coordinate of the hole, you go to the factor that you canceled out. You set that factor equal to zero and you solve it. And that's how you get your negative six. But to figure out the y coordinate of the hole, you plug in negative six for all the x's that show up in the reduced version. So it's negative six times negative six minus one, all divided by negative six minus six. So in the numerator, negative 6 times negative 7 is positive 42. And in the denominator, negative 6 minus 6 is negative 12. You can reduce it, but it does come out to be a negative answer. You have 21 over 6, but that can be reduced again. Or you can just do it in one shot and say, I know 6 goes into both of them evenly. 7 over 2. So that is your y coordinate of the whole. And seven divided by two is three and a half, so it's negative six, negative three and a half. Now, the second thing that you need to do is figure out what the x-intercepts are. So when you're going for x-intercepts, you basically just take the reduced version of the function, which is x times x minus one over x minus 6, and you just set it equal to 0. If you cross multiply, 1 times this is x times x minus 1. But x minus 6 times 0 is 0. This is a quadratic because there is an x squared, but it's in factored form, so all you have to do is set each one of the factors equal to 0 and solve. The answer on the left is x is 0. The answer on the right is x is 1. But if I'm going to ask for x-intercepts, you have to answer the question with a point. So when the x value is 0, you made the y value 0. That's one of them. And when the x value is 1, the y value is still 0. That's the only other x-intercept in the problem. Once you are finished with the x-intercepts, you're required to go for the y-intercept. In order to figure out the y-intercept, all you have to do is evaluate the function at zero. And I am definitely using the reduced version. So plug in a zero in for all the x's that show up in the problem. And if you do that, you get 0 times a negative 1, which is 0, and 0 minus 6, which is negative 6, but the division gives you 0. Intercepts have to be answered as points, so when x is 0, the y value comes out to be 0. And this is the y-intercept.
in the problem. Once you have finished your y-intercepts, then you proceed to go to vertical asymptotes. When you are looking for a vertical asymptote, all you have to do is take the reduced version of the function and denominator and set the denominator equal to zero. When you solve, you get x equals six. But since vertical asymptotes are lines, you keep the equal sign in the problem. The next feature you have to look for are horizontal asymptotes. And when you are looking at horizontal asymptotes, you are comparing the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator. And I usually just look back at the problem written in black. When you note that the degree of the numerator, which is three, is actually greater than the degree of the denominator, which in this case, that degree is two. So this is the format that you're following. There is no horizontal asymptote in that scenario. So if there's no horizontal asymptote, that's when you are forced to have a slant asymptote, only when the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator. So that is one thing I did not go over on how to figure out. So that's what we're going to do right now. To calculate what your slant asymptote is, what you need to do is go to the reduced version, which is up there, right? And you're going to write it down as x squared minus x over x minus 6. And you are going to do synthetic division. So you are going to do synthetic division, which is that drop down mama. That's how you get the slant asymptote. All right, so when you are ready to do synthetic division, you look at the denominator, you set it equal to zero, and you solve. You get the number six. That's the first number. Then you proceed to put in all the coefficients in order for the numerator. So the x to the second has a coefficient of one. The x has a coefficient of negative one. And the constant, which you do not see, but it's really there, so you have to put it in, has a coefficient of zero. So the constant has to be the last thing because underneath always ends up being the remainder. So that has to be put in. So here is your remainder. So now that the problem for synthetic division is actually set up, I'm actually going to do the division. And that's your drop down mama. You drop down the first number and then you multiply. You drop down, meaning you combine down, and then you multiply. And then you combine down. When you are looking for the slant asymptote, you're supposed to ignore the remainder. That's how you do it, you ignore the remainder. And if your numerator was degree two, then your answer is degree one. Y equals one X plus five. This is your slant asymptote. Okay, so I ran out of room on the board, but I think I can actually fit the information that I need to fit in before I erase everything. So my question is going to be, does f of x intersect the slant asymptote? So I'm going to write down slant asymptote intersect. And I'm just going to put a question mark because it's something that I have to answer because that is the next part. So you take the function, okay, with, uh, the reduced version, sorry, the reduced version, x times x minus 1 over x minus 6. And you actually set it equal to the slant asymptote, x plus 5. And then, yes, you have to cross multiply, which requires a little bit of work. 
So 1 times the top expression just multiplies out to x squared minus x. But on the bottom one, you have to do double distributive. x times x is x squared. x times 5 is 5x. Negative 6 times 5 is, I'm sorry, negative 6 times x is negative 6x. And finally, negative 6 times 5 is negative 30. When you combine like terms on the right-hand side, and I'll move it over here just so you can see, I'll write a little bit higher. You get x squared minus x equals x squared minus x minus 30. When you subtract x squared from both sides and you add x to both sides, you will notice that you end up with 0 equals negative 30, which makes absolutely no sense. And therefore, no, it does not intersect the slant asymptote. So before you erase the board and forget everything that I have written down, I will write down that important information on the top right. There is a hole in the graph at the point negative 6, I'm going to change it into negative 3.5 because that's what 7 divided by 2 is. Then there is an x-intercept and there are two of them. One is at 0, 0 and the other one is at 1, 0. Then there is a y-intercept. That is at the origin 0, 0. There is a vertical asymptote at x equals 6. There is no horizontal asymptote, but there is a slant asymptote. So I'm going to write down no horizontal asymptote, but there is a slant asymptote, and we said it is y equals x plus 5. We just checked, and we know that the slant asymptote is never intersected. I'm going to say not crossed. You can only get close to it. You can't actually cross it. So I will eliminate everything on the board that I kind of put up on the top right. And the next thing I'm asked to do is to actually figure out the symmetry. So when it comes to symmetry, what you need to do is evaluate the original. This you cannot use the reduced version. You have to use the original at negative x. So if you plug in a negative x for all the x's that show up across the entire problem, in the numerator and also in the denominator. You're ready to go. I want you to simplify all the signs on the right hand side. So a negative to the third power is still negative. A negative to the second power is positive. And a negative times a negative is positive. In the bottom, a negative to the second power is positive and this is what I have. But math students, math teachers, we never start off an expression with negative, a polynomial. So in the numerator, you can't have that negative in front. So you are required to factor out a negative one out of the numerator, which just switches the signs. So it's x cubed minus 5x squared plus 6x. I'm sorry, minus 6x. You do not have to do anything in the denominator because it starts off with a positive coefficient. But then you take that negative and bring it to the front of the fraction, which means you now are looking at a negative fraction. So that is x cubed minus 5x squared minus 6x all over x squared minus 36. You should know before you begin that this is not a perfect match to that because this is minus and that's plus. Everything else matches, but that doesn't. 
If it is not an exact match, you write down f of negative x is not equal to f of x. Because if it was, that would imply even symmetry, but there is none. Now, the honest truth is that was a waste of time because when you have a negative sign in front, the only one you could test for is odd symmetry. And if they're not matching, well, it can't have odd symmetry either. So when there's a negative sign in front, you're really checking for odd symmetry. You automatically know there is no even symmetry. So f of negative x is also not equal to the negative f of x. And that means that there is no odd symmetry. So now it is up to me to draw a sketch of this graph and then go through what is the domain and what is the range. So when you are ready, please draw yourself a coordinate grid. Label the x-axis and label the y-axis. And let's go through the information. There is a hole in the graph at negative 6, negative 3 and a half. There is an x-intercept at the origin, but there's also an x-intercept at 1 comma 0. There is a y-intercept at the origin. There is a vertical asymptote at x equals 6. There is no horizontal asymptote, but there is a slant asymptote, and you have to graph it correctly. The y-intercept is 5. But then the slope is up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. Up. You can go on forever, but here's the thing. When you have two asymptotes that are not parallel, meaning one's vertical, one's horizontal, or one's vertical and one's slant, you have to draw them long enough so that they actually intersect each other. So you're required to do that. Oh, did I mess up somewhere? I did. No, I didn't, okay. So you have to draw them long enough so that they intersect. So then, um, I'm all out of information for me to put down on this graph. It's just time for me to graph. So basically what you have to do is this. You stare and you're not checking any hor uh, slant asymptotes or horizontals. You always surround the zeros and the vertical asymptotes. So you want a section on the x-axis that goes from negative infinity to zero. That's this section. Then you want a section in between from zero to one. But then you want a section here that goes from one to six. And then finally a section that's here that goes from six to infinity. So you have to test four different sections. The first section I'm gonna pick a negative one. And when I do that, I look at the reduced version a negative 1 times a negative 2 is a positive. And a negative 1 minus 6 is a negative. And when you divide, you get a negative answer, which just means you are below the x-axis. So I'm going to just extend this a little further out before I graph. All right? You are supposed to be below the x-axis. So I guess I'm going to use this color. I am below the x-axis. I have to pick up the hole in the graph and stay below the x-axis. I've got to do a little bit better job. Hold the hole in the graph. But you're gravitating towards that dotted line. You're getting closer. You never touch 
the slant asymptote ever. It just gradually runs side by side. So I really don't know. It doesn't look fantastic to me. You might not be so close here, right? But eventually you'll be really close to the green line. So as long as you draw in something like that, I'm okay with that, all right? Then your job is to test somewhere in between zero and one. And unfortunately you have to pick a half, but a half times a negative is negative. And a half minus six is negative. And a negative divided by a negative is a positive, which just means between zero and one, you're above the x-axis. So it's a little peak in there. Now, when you check between the number one and six, you may want to pick the number two. And if you pick a two, it is two times one, which is positive. And it's two minus six, which is negative. And a positive divided by a negative is a negative, which tells me that I'm below the x-axis. And remember, you have to stay within the window and follow that dotted green line. So this gravitates towards that green line, and this one eventually gravitates towards this green line. And that's what the bottom looks like, but you're not done. Because you still need to pick a number between six and infinity, and I'm gonna pick 10. And 10 times nine is positive, and 10 minus six is positive, and a positive divided by a positive is a positive, which tells me I am above the x-axis, above it. So the last section of your graph, like it or not, is this. It's got to fully stay above the x-axis. If you hug it down here, it's going to hit the x-axis. That's what your picture looks like. Now, you have to do the domain and you have to do the range, but that is your picture. The domain is the easy one because that's the one that has a set number of rules. In the domain, it is your job to jump over the X coordinate of the hole and the vertical asymptote. So you're not gonna include a negative six and you're not gonna include a positive six. So your domain is negative infinity to negative six, negative six to positive six, and then six to infinity you are jumping over negative six and positive six. But the range is harder because you have to look at the picture. Am I supposed to skip the y coordinate of the hole? The answer is no, because technically negative 3.5 is picked up on this side for a y value. So you are not skipping the y coordinate of the hole. But do you realize that there's this big gap between the two pink curves. And in this class, there is no way you can figure out how high this one is. But I'm gonna make it up. And I'm gonna say that this point that I'm labeling with a capital A has coordinates of x1, y1. I don't know what they are. I know x1 is between zero and one. And I know that y1 is a positive number and it's probably not very high. And this one over here, I don't know what that is. I have no idea. But I do know that I'm going to call it point B. And I'm going to say the coordinates are X2 and Y2. And I at least know that they are both positive numbers because of their positioning. There's this huge gap between Y1 and Y2's height. So you have to skip that whole section. So your range goes from negative infinity to the y1 value. And it's a bracket because there's a point there. But then it skips that whole section in between and it picks up at the y2 height and goes all the way up to infinity. And that is how you write down the range in this course.